I'm really excited to be here today. Um, and I wanted to talk a little bit about just this journey into uh, really futzing with the journalistic model and having technology be part of that to help empower the civic imagination and to create new opportunities. And so you'll see some connections to tech and civic whatnot, but it won't happen for a little while, so we'll just be a little patient here. Um, but I wanted to give you a backstory as to the questions that have kind of propelled um, this whole journey that I've been on and hopefully will be on for a while. Uh, and to start, I just want to, you know, who doesn't love this guy? This guy's amazing, Fred Rogers. He's someone who I keep looking to over and over again, um, just in, in times of trouble and times of goodness. But he, he always has something good to say. And, and two things that Fred really stood for are listening and curiosity. And here he says, you know, listening and trying to understand the needs of those we would communicate with seems to me to be the essential prerequisite of any real communication and we might as well aim for real communication. Journalism, I would say, is trying to do well at communication and could do more at listening. The other thing he talks about is wonder. He really is an advocate for curiosity and for asking questions and for following that curiosity. And these have been really the two themes of the last 10 years of my life as a journalist and as now a, an entrepreneur is curiosity and listening. So Curious City, you can probably see, is a play on the word curiosity itself. And then Harkin, the name of the company that I run now, is all about listening. The word itself means to listen and to give respectful attention. So I'm going to take you on just a little bit of a background journey as to how um, this whole process change happened. And I do think there's lots of process change like this that can happen in city government, in healthcare, in libraries, and in institutions that really uphold democracy. So I see what we're doing here as an example of, of a process that can really uh, be applied to many different industries. So in 2011, um, I was a few pounds lighter, I had longer hair and better glasses. And I was working at WBEZ as a journalist and I kind of got into journalism accidentally through a back door when no one was looking. I, I started interning and then uh, doing stories and then suddenly I was there in the room where the decisions were made, in the room where it happened, so to speak. And these were questions I had that I couldn't find great answers to from my fellow reporters. One was, how do we know and how can we actually know as a small group of people what the information needs are of the public we're serving. I mean, as, as much as WBEZ strives to be diverse and inclusive, they don't look like everyone in Chicago. They don't have those same experiences. So how can we know what the information the rest of the city needs? And that led me to wonder, why is the public not consulted about what information they need when we're making decisions? And then that led me to wonder, what would happen if we invited them into the process? What if they were there when those decisions were made? Would journalism break? Would it get better? I really wanted to figure that out. And then lastly, I'm not a news junkie, even though I worked in news for a long time. I find learning extremely enjoyable, and I feel like news is about learning, but I don't find reading the news very enjoyable. So that was something I also wanted to figure out how to play with a little bit, make it more accessible, make it easier to take in information that's useful. And so just to look at journalism, how, how it's really created right now. Um, the public is usually not involved in any major decision until it's too late, after stories have been published, after they're out in the world, and the journalist is running on to do their next story. So this means that all the public can really do is comment on what's been made. We know that's not the greatest place in the world for actionable insight in most places. Um, and you know, this isn't an opportunity to learn from one another and to iterate and to get better. And so the story cycle that I started to play with was really about bringing the public in at every step of the way. So giving them power to make decisions when those decisions were being made. So at the pitch phase, it's about collecting the public's questions. At the assignment phase, allowing them to vote on each other's ideas. And at the reporting phase, actually having the question asker be able to be part of that storytelling process. I don't know if you were part of that storytelling process with the blacksmith. Were you able to be part of it? OK, great. That's how it works when it's working well. Um, and then you can keep the cycle going by uh, collecting follow-up questions, too. Put it in another way, kind of pictorially, you know, this is what journalism and a lot of institutions are actually positioned in terms of you know, society, is saying, this is what we think you need to know, or this is what we think you need. And it's treating the public as a series of data or demographics or dollar signs. And it's looking at the public as a big abstract idea of a mass of people, which is really a categorical error. There are no such things as masses. There's just collections of people that we generalize about. 
And so the model that we were playing with here is about really flipping that and treating people as individuals and asking them, what do you not know that we could find out for you? Because as journalists, our job is to find out information that's going to be useful to you. So tell us how we can be best put to work. So enter Curious City. This is really playing with this methodology in action, collecting people's questions, assigning, and reporting. But in order to get this actually part of the newsroom culture, I had to get over a lot of different barriers and a lot of different questions that people had about how this stuff worked. Um, oh yeah, we have a very nice animated um, GIF here. Um, so first question people had in the newsroom was, wait, does the public actually have good questions? You know, we're the journalists, we're the experts. Is the public actually going to provide us anything of value that we don't know? Um, it turns out they have great questions, as you heard from our uh, fellow compadres here who have excellent questions. The public has amazing ideas that journalists might not have thought of or would never get past an editor, frankly. So these are just some of the examples of questions that uh, Curious City has answered. What we found is that the public, inviting them into the process, means we get fresh inputs, which lead to different outputs. So they can provide a fresh stream of diverse story ideas that we never would have thought of. Another question we had to answer was, would the public actually be interested in being part of this process? Do they care, or do they just want the news, or would they want to be involved? And so we created voting rounds and put these on the site so that the public had a chance to weigh in on a small selection of questions, so it was super easy for them to make their, their needs known there. And it turns out they loved being involved. So we have people coming into the studio. We have folks going out on assignment with reporters, getting to meet people, get access to officials or people in power that they never would have access to otherwise. And this really creates new editorial possibilities. Bringing the public in means we can do stories that an editor would never say yes to. So like, here's some examples of stories we've done that were in a voting round. People asking about a prison camp in Chicago during the Civil War. If I would pitch that to my editor, they would say, who the hell cares and why now? This is the Civil War. We don't need to do this. But if a thousand people vote for it, I can tell my editor, people want this. This is interesting. So these are the types of possibilities that it opened up, not just having things were reactive news stories of what's happening yesterday, but giving us an understanding of the context of where we live how it got to be this way, how decisions got made, which allows us to understand how to make new decisions. And this also means good for the newsroom is that people will market the stories if they're part of it. So for example, this woman, Sarah Lynn Pablo, wanted to know the origin of the Chicago accent. Her question was up for a vote, and she's tweeting about it like every three minutes. So this is also great PR and marketing for the newsroom, you know, who would love for people to be advocating on their behalf to go to their site and to check out their services that they offer. And then also just going out with people on reporting. This is Odette Youssef, an amazing reporter at WBEZ. She's out here answering a question about how Chinatown moved from the north side to the south side. And by having a member of the public along, you guys know this in your field, this is user testing. This is making sure the product that you're creating is best suited for the, pre the people you're creating it for before it's pushed, before it's live, before it's out there. So this is something that reporters have never done before. They've never been able to beta test stories in a public way before they put them out. And so this is another way of saying design thinking. Does, do folks know here what design thinking is? OK, so it's, yeah, design thinking at the story level. Empathizing, defining, ideating, prototyping, and then testing it and doing it all over again. So another question I had to answer here is, would reporters, this was a hard one, would they find value in having the public along for the ride? Uh, not every reporter was super excited about uh, having uh, random people that they've never met in with a source or you know, an alderman or someone that they needed to keep a good relationship with. But I'm happy to say we've never had a problem. Everyone's been incredible. Having folks along uh, means that they can ask questions to officials that a reporter wouldn't be able to ask. So this woman, Andrea Lee here, uh, wanted to know what the hell an alderman does all day. And <laughs> you can imagine if the reporter just said, hi, we're going to do a story and we're going to follow you around all day, the alderman would be like, what are you doing? <laughs> like, what do you want to know? Why are you here? It would be a very different dynamic. But because Al here, Alex Keith, this reporter, was trying to serve the member of the public, he was able to bring her along, and she was able to ask Alderman Burnett a lot of uncomfortable questions that Al wouldn't have been able to. So she, at the end of the day, there's a great video on the site of this, but she's like, what the hell are you doing with your time? You're, you're working, you know, talking about pigeon poop with one person, doing pregnancy tests with another, like, you gotta fix potholes, what are you doing? 
So she was able to have that dynamic that the reporter wasn't able to have, which made A, for a much better story, and B, for much better public service. And so the good news is a lot of reporters did respond well to this, and they did like having the person along and discovering new things for themselves. The other thing we found is that reporters often think that they know the answer to a question because they've been reporting on something for a while, and if a member of the public comes in and asks an elementary question, they often find out things they never knew, or they have their mind totally changed. So that's another great part of it. And then the last thing I needed to figure out is whether the public would connect with our work more deeply if they were reflected in it. So my thought was, if our work is more representative, it's going to be uh, more relevant to people and more useful. And this is, um, just, these are some stats from 2014, right before I left WBEZ, but just 2% of the stories posted to the site were done with this process, and they accounted for almost half of the top stories of the year. So these stories that came from the public interest were far more relevant to the audience. And then we also were able to collect zip codes from people when they were asking questions and do a heat map to see which communities were we hearing from a lot and which weren't we. And that means we were able to go and do interventions to try and hear from communities that we weren't serving well. So this was another way of trying to understand what's the curiosity of the city and how does it change depending on the neighborhood you're in, the demographics you're serving, et cetera. And so what we learned is that this whole process really directly served the public mission of public media, and it also generated revenue. You've probably heard newsrooms are having a hard time on the money front these days, and so what was very exciting about this is not only editorially was it good for us, but it also is helping um, with the business side of things. So the people who are putting in their email addresses, a lot of them aren't members of the newsroom yet. So this is a great way of collecting email addresses to see who wants to become a member, They've gotten a lot of advertising underwriting as well, and then they're doing events that are selling out. And then we're also doing civic partnerships, so collaborating with the Museum of Contemporary Art to have uh, stories about Chicago alongside images of Chicago. Uh, the Chicago Architecture Foundation and WBEZ collaborate to answer questions about the built environment. And then also sometimes these stories jump from being on air to being in the community. So a story about Beverly became a town hall meeting about Beverly and the future of gentrification and um, race relations in Beverly. Uh, a great question that was answered uh, pretty recently, about a year ago. Uh, someone wanted to know if Chicago's Arab and African American Muslims share mosques, and if not, why not? And that meant that the newsroom brought in four different imams to have that conversation. And about a month later, the imams came back and said, you know what, we need to have this conversation in our community too. Will you facilitate that dialogue in one of our mosques? So this is a way of the newsroom really being of service to the community in ways that it hadn't been before. So fast forward, this is like two years at WBEZ. I'm thinking other newsrooms could probably do this too. So the next question I was looking to answer is whether or not this public powered model could scale and would more newsrooms listen to the public if we made it easier for them to do so? And so I was able to get some money. I went into a startup accelerator program in San Francisco uh, to try and figure this out um, and launched Harkin out of that. And so what we've learned in the last three years of having this company Harkin is that the same thing, the more people feel heard, the more that they see they're being served directly, the more likely they are to trust and to also support you financially. It's not rocket science, but it's something that you know, we need to learn over and over again. And so what we're trying to do here is really treat citizens as the most important actor in a democracy. And individuals have information needs, communities have information needs, and right now newsrooms are just pushing out what they think those individuals and communities need without having any way of understanding that. So what we are doing here is really connecting, being a conduit for the community to tell the newsroom how it can best be of use so that the citizens can do the work of citizens in a democracy. So since we launched about three years ago, we're in around 150 newsrooms now, so there's a lot more Curious City uh, cousins around the world. There's some fun names like Curiosity in Detroit, uh, Brave Little State in Vermont, which is an amazing podcast, Bay Curious in San Francisco. Um, that was a controversial one in the newsroom, but they, they did it and I'm proud of them. Um, and we ended up developing a technology just to make it easier for the workflow of journalists, because if they're using 
Google Docs and SurveyMonkey and WooFu and blah, blah, blah to try and get all of this information and collate it, they're going to say, this is too much of a pain in the ass. I'm not going to do it. So we ended up really creating the tech in order to help the methodology be easier for them to use. It's really not about the technology. You can do this approach with pen and paper. This is about making it easily scalable within the newsroom and making this not be an excuse to not listen to the public. And so with the tech, we have kind of two sides of it. There's the public facing, what folks enter their questions into or vote, and then the EMS, so the engagement management system that the newsroom uses to you know, keep all this stuff consolidated. And then it doesn't matter the final products, um, it's the same process. So we've also been able to try and connect this to um, newsrooms' uh, bottom lines as well. So allowing people to uh, opt in to getting, uh, their, getting alerted if the question gets answered, to signing up for newsletters and going straight into a CRM. And so I'll give you just a few examples of some of these use cases beyond Curious City. So we work with newsrooms as tiny as, tiny as like three-person newsrooms in the middle of Ohio, all the way up to the BBC, and for any kind of format. And so uh, newsrooms are doing investigative stories, breaking news, feature reporting, human interest, all starting with the public's questions. Um, I'm going to skip this because it's not as interesting. Uh, but uh, we put these direct embeds on people's sites so they can cut and paste these. They're really super lightweight embeds that they can place wherever they'd like. And then um, they use them in lots of different situations. So one quick example is the BBC. So you probably remember when the Brexit news broke a couple years ago. They put the story out. At the bottom of the story, they asked people, what questions do you have about this? And they all went into our EMS. The reporters were able to look and see, OK, what are the things people really want to know? And then they did an FAQ the next day, which ended up being a really um, top performing story because it was so relevant to people. It wasn't the newsroom saying, here's what we think you should know tomorrow. It was really based on people's urgent questions. Um, and a lot of people are doing enterprise and feature reporting, so like Curious City. Uh, you know, winning awards, doing really terrific reporting of original stories that nobody else is doing, uh, doing experimental reporting as well. I don't know if you guys heard this one. I'm really excited about what happened with it, but someone asked why there aren't any statues of women in Chicago that aren't just figurative, like, um, you know, angels and whatnot, but we have so many incredible historical women who lived here. Why don't we have any statues commemorating them? And so they answered the question about how statues get made, but then they also asked citizens to, um, to put up who they think should be a statue should be made of. And I've heard now tale that there's a group of people together who are making statues of famous Chicago women and are going to be getting them placed around the city. So that's just with someone's question, which I'm so excited about. Um, and then there's also newsrooms doing really quick turnaround reporting too. So if there's a major breaking news from the person who runs our country, then you're able to ask a question uh, to a talk show to talk about that and have it be as part of the national conversation. Um, one of our partners in Southern California, there was wildfires earlier this year, and they did Harkin powered stories for three or four days straight while those fires were raging, just answering people's questions as quickly as possible. And that gets me really excited about what if newsrooms could act more like a utility to the communities that they serve? Because you know when you have a fire, you call the fire department. But when you have a question, you don't go to the newsroom. You usually Google it. And if you can't find something that seems um, truthful or, or that you can find, you either forget about it or you, know, you do some deep diving and you may or may not find the answer. But you don't have any other recourse. What if people knew that they could go to their journalists and get those stories answered? That's what I would love to see. So long story short, Harkin, we're finding the same thing is that when you put the public at the center of your model, the value follows. So we're finding that revenue is following this approach. Uh, we're finding that these stories are performing way better than other stories in our other newsrooms as well, and that the public is also being empowered to have their questions answered and to change their communities. So I'll tell you just a quick two stories here about two things that have happened just with questions. So this woman in Nashville, Denise, wanted to know about this park named Fred Douglas Park in Nashville. She's like, who's Fred Douglas and why does he have a park named after him? Because if this is supposed to be for Frederick Douglas, you spelled his name wrong and you should probably redo the sign. And so she ended up asking the newsroom. They decided to look into it. They go to city council. They start looking through the archives. And nobody knows who Fred Douglas was, who this park was named after. And after some deep dives in the archives, they realized that, yes, this was supposed to be named for Frederick Douglass. 
But this was an 80-year-old slight. The town apparently wasn't ready to name the park after the famed abolitionist. So this question ended up uh, inspiring city council to rededicate the park, make a new sign, and also have this great Frederick Douglass impersonator uh, giving, <laughs> you know, dedicating the sign. And you can imagine if Denise had just asked city council, who's Fred Douglass, can you look into it? That would have been at the bottom of their inbox. There's no way they would have elevated that to something that they should pay attention to. But because they had the power of the newsroom behind them, they had to pay attention. So this is a way of sharing the power with the public so that they can get things to happen that otherwise wouldn't as an individual. Another quick story, this woman, Janice Thompson in Chicago, wanted to know how much of our electricity comes from fracked natural gas. And she lived in Europe for a while where their bills show them a breakdown, like a pie chart, of where their energy comes from. And she wanted to know why can't we have that here. And so she asked Curious City. We ended up doing two stories about how impossible it was to figure out how energy flowed because of how opaque um, just the, the system is and how the laws are where you don't have to show where things came from. So we felt bummed out that we couldn't actually answer her question. But lo and behold, a year later, we got a Google alert with Curious City in there from a blog post that she wrote that because she learned so much about electricity in the process and because she got so invested in it because we were keeping her apprised the whole way and involving her, she felt like she had to be part of the solution. So she ended up quitting her job to become an energy educator in the community and let people know about their energy choices. And that's just because she was paid attention to, we valued her input, and um, she ended up wanting to make a difference there. So these are the kinds of things that I see possible and I get really excited about if every newsroom around the world had a way of listening to their public and answering to their public and acting more like a utility. I think even if they did a quarter of their stories starting from outside of the newsroom, we would have an entirely different media landscape. That's, you know, who knows if I'll live to see the day if that's true, but that's, that's my supposition. So what we're ultimately up against and we're trying to do, which is really hard and it's not about technology, it's about culture and it's about process and it's about mindset, is we're trying to help newsrooms shift from this approach of we have all these beasts to feed. You know, whether or not it's how many, you know, uh, you know, how many columns we need to put out this today, how many hours of radio or TV we need to fill, or how many alerts we need to send to people's smartwatches. It's really focused on the container and how many of them we're making. And what we're trying to help newsrooms do is flip the mindset to what can we help the public understand or do, as that being the primary thing that they're focused on. And with that, um, you know, using a different process, using a different workflow, having different metrics of success, and having different economic priorities. So it's uh, not an easy task. We're trying to make inroads bit by bit, project by project, but some newsrooms are starting to take on this approach and think of it as a practice and not as a project, and thinking of it as every reporter should be listening and not just one little section of the newsroom. And so some of the things we're thinking about going forward, and if anyone has ideas, I'd love to talk to you, um, just about building efficient workflows, tools, and processes. We're gonna be expanding our technology tool set. Does anybody here know Elm? <laughs> yes, okay. <laughs> My former CTO started coding everything in Elm, and I'm like, are we gonna be able to find anyone <laughs> who's gonna be able to help us if we grow? Um, apparently it's fun, yeah? It's great? Okay, good. Okay, thank you. <laughs> You're making me feel better. He's a plant, yeah. <laughs> um, and Elm is a tree. It's also a language. Um, so we're trying to expand also our consulting offerings to help newsrooms take on this mindset and then really just help shift that culture from a, you know, how many beasts do we need to feed to what can we really help people understand or do. And so that was a lot of information. Um, thanks for listening, and I'm happy to take any questions if we have time. The first question here, I know you started answering this somewhat, but what other news organizations in other cities are adopting public power journalism? Yeah, so a lot of public media, and I think that's because I came out of public media and they've known about it for a while, and it directly serves the public media mission. Um, but beyond that, uh, so we're working with about 150 newsrooms. I would say 75% of them are probably nonprofits. The rest are some commercials, so that's TV stations, newspapers, 
Um, there's newsrooms that are topic focused, so they're uh, focused on specific uh, subject matter, education, gun violence, et cetera. And then others are geographically focused, so local news or regional. Um, we're starting to work with the Better Government Association here in Chicago, which we're really excited about. Um, we've worked with a religion, we've worked with a museum, and we're eager to work with government as well. So we think there's lots of applications to our tech in this methodology. We just don't really have a sales staff to go out hunting for folks. So if you know of anyone who might be open to this, I'd love to learn more. What was the museum application? The museum application? Yeah, so the museum, um, the Minnesota, Minneapolis Institute of Art, the MIA, was using Harkin for a little while to take questions about their exhibits. Uh, so they were planning a big exhibit about uh, Buddhism, and they have a really big Hmong community in Minnesota, and they were trying to understand what questions people had about Buddhist art so that they could create better um, uh, installations and exhibits that were more useful to people rather than looking from a curatorial point of view, which is kind of like how journalists can look sometimes. Um, looking from a community based like what would be helpful for you to understand about you know this collection of art so that was one way that they were using it and for events too can you talk a bit more about the voting system for questions and if there are any challenges that you've encountered yeah so voting voting is tough as you know people can try and hack into things and, and vote in different ways so we have fraud detection on our voting system it's a pretty lightweight application what we built overall um, it's just people you know in the newsroom deciding which questions to put up for a vote and then they can embed a simple module whether it's like on a sidebar or wherever um, direct link to it and then the public is allowed to vote and the voting system can uh, can shut down at a particular time and if there's voting fraud we send an alert we were doing it via IP address before to some degree um, but you know there's some universities that are all on the same address so you know there could be 50 legit votes coming from the same IP address so we're looking a little bit for patterns that are showing up. We don't, it hasn't been a big problem so far, knock on wood, um, but when uh, we do detect fraud, the newsroom can delete all those votes just to keep that, that round fresh if it seems like someone's tampering with it, but it hasn't happened much. Did that answer your question? Okay. Yeah, there's no, it's not like Reddit. So um, the newsroom curates a very small set. So it might be like three or five questions and then uh, they're curating them because they're, they don't want uh, Reddit style, like someone asking a question, if they're like, why does the mayor suck? And then everybody upvotes it. <laughs> it's like, as a journalist, you can't start your story with, from that you know, biased starting point. <laughs> I mean, you could, uh, depending on your outlet. But um, this is a way of basically the newsroom being able to use their editorial judgment and say, these are the ones we think, A, we have the resources to do. Because some people ask questions that are like a college thesis. Like you can't answer them you know, easily. So trying to find the ones that are the right scope, the right size, the right tone to pair together, and then letting the public ultimately decide. So it's not a free for all to upvote everything. What are some unexpected interactions with your platform? Not necessarily unexpected stories, but interactions on the platform. That's a great question. Um, I mean, people all people will tell you much more than you think that they. I think this is probably for a lot of the journalists we worked with. Sometimes they'll ask folks not for questions but for stories, like, "Have you experienced X thing or Y thing?" And people will will really share and open up um, with incredible detail about things they're going through in life, things that they're interested in. And I also think people are, uh, or the public, this is coming from like a newsroom brain where a lot of reporters are, are fearful that the public uh, hates them <laughs> for lots of reasons, as you can imagine. Um, so I think uh, unexpectedly reporters are seeing that people are really uh, responding well to this and they're really appreciative and open to, um, to sharing more than, than the public thought and things of value. But I don't know that there's any like, unexpected activities if that's more of like a tech question of people doing weird things with it. So I don't know if that answered it. With the sort of the shift from traditional journalism to public power journalism, it seems like there's sort of a, like a retraining that's needed in the newsroom. Um, is there any sort of parallel retraining that the public needs in order to become more used to this system? Oh, that's such a great question. Um, 
newsrooms do need retraining and that's a lot of what we do. At first I thought, oh, we could be a scalable tech company. We could be like a SaaS company and just, you know, we tell them once how to do it and then they throw the widget on there and boom, billions of dollars. Not really. Um, but I thought, I thought we could be more scalable than we are, but it really is behavior change and it's culture change and that's not a widget. That's conversations, that's new experiences, that's process, that's the, the unscalable stuff. Um, in terms of the public, I've never seen a population that has been asked for questions not respond with amazing questions. It's like they're so ready, they're so there. Not everybody's gonna wanna participate in that way and ask questions, maybe they'll wanna vote, maybe they'll just wanna consume the content, that's fine, but we haven't found that the public needs training. It's more of like, can the newsroom prove that they're gonna be responsive enough for the public to start thinking of them when they have questions. And to me, that's about consistency, frequency, showing up and like doing the work. Yeah. Have, you, have you ever thought about the uh, Oh My News model, uh, taking it a little bit further where citizen journalists actually write some of the stories which are then edited by journalists? I would love that. I think that's probably a bridge too far for most of our partners right now. Um, we even talked about before, well actually in the Curious City earlier model we had um, discussed the commenting platform that was on there. We wanted to allow the public to answer each other's questions. Um, you know, there's amazing people in this community. I don't know if you guys know Dennis McClendon, but he's like rain man of Chicago knowledge. Um, but he would frequently be on our site answering questions. We're like, this is great, should we put a badge that says like this is community answered? And then the question came up of, well how do we know he's right? And then our, do we have to now deploy our resources to follow everything that, you know, Dennis, if Dennis comments on 30 stories, now do we need to have two full-time people vetting Dennis's work if we're gonna say this is true? We need to, as journalists, we need to be able to fact check and validate that. So I think a lot of newsrooms um, wouldn't be at that level. I think that'd be great if they did. In terms of working with citizens to do the journalism, I think there's still a lot of um, cultural barriers to be crossed with newsrooms feeling comfortable with that. I think City Bureau here in Chicago um, is doing incredible work that's kind of starting to bridge that divide. But um, I would say most of our partners probably would be like, that's, that's a little too much. I hope though one day that they would be open to that. Uh, City Bureau in Chicago. They're incredible. If you guys don't know about them, check them out. They're in our backyard here doing really amazing work. So you mentioned you had, um, you guys were tracking like the zip codes from where the questions were coming from and then trying to reach out to the ones that were less uh, represented. How did you do that and what were the results like? Great question. So actually, um, McCormick here Foundation funded a study for us to do that and we wanted to test a few different methodologies. So one is using Facebook seeing if we could use Facebook targeting to find more folks in those zip codes. And then another was community partnerships, so working with faith groups and different com um, you know, folks who are already in those communities who had connections. And then the third was working with local libraries um, to actually have a booth there and collect questions at different branches around the city. The one that worked far and away the best was libraries. Uh, people who are coming in there are coming in to get information. They are, um, it's a place where people are trusted. It's a spot where reporters can be visible and seen and you know, have a good interaction. Facebook did not work well at all. So it's really, that stuff didn't scale well either in terms of having physical people go out there, but that was the most effective. You talk about changing culture in the newsroom. Have you made any efforts to go into the journalism schools and change that or work with college campus newspapers? Yeah, get them young, right? <laughs> um, yes, we're actually working with a number of uh, universities right now and we launched a subsidy program so that college papers could start to use us and we could start to teach um, students this model before they go out into the, the world and that they can come into a newsroom with this mindset versus having to learn different habits and you know, have the cognitive dissonance that comes with that. Um, so one quick thing I wanted to just mention before um, you get on to the rest of your evening. Uh, I was just curious, is anyone here running a company? Okay, oh, hey, nice to see you, Carl. Okay, we've got some folks running companies here. Okay, great. Um, I just wanted to point you to another resource. This is like on nights and weekends, I'm working with a bunch of women CEOs um, who are running a community of uh, zebra companies. So instead of unicorns that are, you know, companies supposed to make a billion dollars and, you know, break the world, 
Um, we are <laughs> we are proponents of a different kind of company, one we're calling Zebras, which are black and white. They're for profit and for purpose. So they do have some degree of scalability. They're not a good fit for nonprofit funding because they do have profitable potential. Um, and they also can't get venture funding because they're not gonna be 10X companies. Um, so we have a little chart here. It's probably hard to see, but if you go to zebrasunite.com, if you're running a company and you're looking for uh, a community of people trying to bridge the gap between uh, for profit and for purpose, um, there's a lot of amazing people there. We're trying to come up with new term sheets, new legal structures for companies looking to do civic good um, while also making a profit. So that's that. Thank you so much. All right, Jennifer Brandel, thank you.